did try to incorporate a little bit more about the Fairline, I'm sorry, not Fairline, it's the California Current, because it's, in some ways it's difficult to say how is ocean acidification affecting various ecosystems. Some it's easier than others, but California Current's actually not that easy because there is not yet a lot of literature on how ocean acidification per se is affecting the California Current or California Current ecosystems. Climate change, on the other hand, you probably have heard a fair amount about how it's affected California or is affecting California current ecosystems or upwelling ecosystems, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, because what I, you know, we hear about ocean acidification and climate warming and hypoxia, but really those always, almost always, if you look at the fossil record, go hand in hand. They're, they're symptoms of a carbon dioxide anomaly in the atmosphere. So whenever there's been something that has led to high CO2 in the atmosphere, we've seen global warming, which leads, of course, to ocean warming and ocean acidification and hypoxia. And the hypoxia is linked mainly to ocean warming. And so this, you can sort of think of these as dominoes of CO2 emissions. And all of these environmental changes can lead to ecosystem changes that affect all of the things that society really wants from the ocean, whether it's the protection of coastlines by coral reefs or mangroves or just fisheries at a sense of way. So what we want to know is way up here, how is, are these environmental changes going to affect things that society cares about? I mean, outside, we love the ocean and we want things to be healthy. Society really wants to make sure that we can get from the ocean what we want. Um, so today I'm really going to tell you a few things, and maybe a little more because I've added some slides, but certainly these things are related to CO2 emissions, just told you. It affects physiology because physiology is really the window that all organisms have to the environment. And it's just physiology that is the fundamental um, basis by which everything else kind of happens. Um, and that can lead to <coughs> potentially large effects on the function and structure of ecosystems and society. And those are kind of the messages. And I'll try to talk somewhat about the uh, California Current. But first I'm going to spend a little, just a little bit of time setting the stage. You know, what, what is CO2? What's going on? This may be review for some of you. If not, then you can listen. Otherwise, take a little nap. Um, but, and, and I like the way I've got this little figure drawn. She's, she's going to be with us through the whole talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then we've got her brother here. And I think there's somebody here that might come on in. Um, anyway, uh, if you've taken some notes, <laughs> it's okay. No, the other side. It doesn't bother me. It's, sorry. It actually, it gives me an opportunity to keep you awake. Little, little joke. Um, so this is 1850 to the present. And these are CO2 emissions in billions of tons of carbon per year. And you see it sort of trundled along, and we started mining or pulling oil out of the ground. And here's where we are. And then around the mid 90s, there were, were the IPCC scenarios that they developed saying, well, where are we headed in the future in terms of emissions? And these different lines are a variety of scenarios that you may or may not know about. Some of them are quite conservative, saying, gosh, we really have to drop down CO2 emissions to stabilize atmospheric CO2 around 350 parts per million. Or there's another economic and societal scenario that says, well, basically, let's just do what we want, not worry so much about conservation, and just let's worry more about growth. Um, and that's the red line. And if you kind of look where we've gone from that, so we started these models, I think these were 1994 models that started back here, and we since have some data now that goes up to 2009, 2010, and you can see we're starting to diverge from the group of models, but if we're doing anything, we're heading up this most liberal line. So in terms of are we worrying about the planet and, and our future in terms of climate change and all of the things that go along with it, acidification, we're not doing a very good job yet with that, and society around the world is going to have to come to grips with that, certainly in the U.S. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Uh, you, this may also be review for you, this little complicated graphs, but the one on the left here is 1940 to the present, and these are CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And in around 1958, Charles Keeling said, I'm going to start measuring CO2 on Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And at the time, everybody thought, why do you want to measure CO2 in the air? It's going to be boring. And what he saw was, it's hard to see, but the red line is going up and down seasonally as the biosphere sort of breathes in and breathes out. It's dominated by photosynthesis in the springtime and it draws CO2 down. And it, respiration dominates in the winter, so CO2 goes up. 
And on top of that seasonal signal, you can see this very clear rise in CO2 in the atmosphere. Started around 325 or 300, and now it's up to, well, now it's up to about 397. Uh, before we started pulling fossil fuels, you may recall it was around 180 or 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. So this is driven entirely by fossil fuel emissions. And around 1984, they started measuring CO2 in the ocean, and, which is a little more difficult. And you can see it's noisy, but it parallels exactly what we see in the air. And then ocean pH, which corresponds to that, has dropped. And obviously, I'm sure you know, ocean pH is lower, it's more acidic. So this is really the best time series for the atmosphere-ocean system <coughs> on what goes on over time. Um, there has since been some very large spatial uh, maps of what's going on in the ocean, and I'll talk about those in a moment. If you look at the, my family here, first of all, we'll discuss this with us. Um, this is the, sort of the Al Gore diagram of ocean, of atmospheric CO2 going down and up, down and up, down and up, and then it's skyrocketing toward our future. Each of these bars is an ice age, and there's sort of this modulation or sort of a pendulum over the last about a million years or so of going between 180, 280, around that. And then we've come up to around here now, and we're heading skyward. And this goes up to around 700. The estimates now are probably around 850 by the end of the century. I've taken those data and said, well, what, what's happened over this same time period for ocean pH? So I just made some simple assumptions about ocean alkalinity, sea level changes, and said, OK, what would pH do? And it modulates in a very similar manner to CO2. It's driven by CO2 in the atmosphere. This is surface ocean pH, by the way. And so when you have low, low CO2, you have high pH. High CO2, low pH. And so where are we headed? We're stepping off a cliff into a very large change in ocean pH in this context of, this is 400,000 years of data here. So that's kind of where we're headed. And the question is, you know, is that going to be a big deal or not? Um, so I don't know, I can give you a little more information. So this is now a larger temporal context, how much CO2 has been in the atmosphere over the last 50 million years. And so this is the present on the left, zero, to 50 million years ago. And these are estimates of how much CO2 has been in the atmosphere. And it's been quite stable over the last 25 million years ago, and then it starts getting quite noisy. Um, part of this noise is due to the difficulty in estimating CO2 in the atmosphere when you go back to but it's clear that you have to go back 25 million years or so to get back to where we were in pre, or to, to reach a level we're now broaching. It's because we've been much lower for that time period. If you go to the more distant past, it goes far higher than this. And we can talk about this. One of the things that comes up with ocean acidification is, well, you know, CO2 has been much higher in the distant past, and there have been flourishing biological communities. What's the big deal? And I, I won't talk about that now, but we can talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, so what happens when you have all of these things going on in the atmosphere? Well, I mentioned you get these, this sort of, these three things that go on, and ocean warming is one of them. And I won't talk much about ocean warming, but this is sort of ocean temperature coming up. Um, and what you see here on the bottom, are these are um, aerosols that are ejected into the atmosphere by a variety of volcanoes that have been going off over the last several decades. And they do have an effect on shading the Earth. And some of this led to some research by Ken Caldera and others about geoengineering a climate solution, where we can inject aerosols into the atmosphere to simulate volcanoes, and that would basically shade the Earth and cool the planet. And actually, Ken's a friend of mine. He said, you know, this is, there's no way this is going to work. And then he started looking into it more, and he realized, God, you don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to inject very much to get a pretty strong effect. So it, it's actually feasible to do this. And as a little aside, I'll take you to the other kind of end of the spectrum. My mother, God love her, I, I do, um, she's very eclectic <laughs> in her belief system. And she, I don't know if you've heard about this thing called chemtrails, where you know you see a contrail in the atmosphere and sometimes it spreads out depending upon atmospheric conditions. There's a group of people out there that thinks that that's a government conspiracy to control either people in some weird way or climate. And my mother's one of these. She lives near Tucson, Arizona, and things are kind of crisscrossing the sky all the time. And a lot of that came from some of Ken and Ken Caldera's and others' work where they talked about aerosols and what geoengineering might be. So I'm getting off on a tangent. It has nothing to do with this talk. I think it has to do with my mother right here. She's the one I'm on. No, it doesn't do it because sometimes we have to kind of frame the issue. <laughs> yeah. So, but one important thing is that if you look at where the heat is going, 
The atmosphere and land are warming, but by far, most of the heat of global warming is in the ocean now because the ocean is such a large heat sink. And about 85 estimates are about 85% of the, the excess heat from global warming is now residing in the ocean. And ocean temperature data corroborate uh, that. Now, the other thing I mentioned is hypoxia. And this is just a paper by Strama et al. last year. This is one shot of the eastern equatorial Pacific, but most sections of the oceans look this way. This is 1960 to the present, going down from the surface to 1,000 meters. And the dark blues are more, are lower oxygen. And you can see that, it's hard to tell here, but it intensifies a little bit. And you can see it's shoaling here. It's getting shallower, and it's basically expanding the oxygen minimum zones. Now, if you're unfamiliar with oxygen minimum zones, they're driven largely by productivity at the surface where you somehow inject nutrients in the surface ocean, phytoplankton bloom, create a uh, biological productivity, and it then begins to cause this rain of organic debris towards the deep sea. And all of the deep sea, except for hydrothermal vent and seed communities, depends upon this organic debris for nutrition. So water, uh, light only penetrates around 200, 300 meters, depends on where you are in the ocean. So anything below that is depending upon this organic debris. And this oxygen minimum zone is caused when all of the organisms in that zone are remineralizing that organic material. They're using it for their food web, so they're consuming oxygen and producing CO2. So we talk about these dead zones. This one's not a dead zone necessarily, but dead zones occur by that same process. The Mississippi is a very famous one where we have all this nutrient runoff from the Mississippi. It's remineral, it's, it stimulates phytoplankton growth sinks and causes this anoxia because all of the oxygen is consumed due to that heavy organic loading in deep water where there is no oxygen. I'm sorry, there's no input of oxygen, there's no production of oxygen, and so all the oxygen is consumed. Now, we hear about those dead zones, and they're appearing all over the, the, uh, the world, but what we usually don't hear about is that all of that oxygen is can be consumed at some respiratory quotient, so there's an equal amount of CO2 that's being produced. So this also means this is a very acidic zone. So ocean acidification is occurring right here in all of these oxygen low areas of the ocean. And as we add more fertilizers to the ocean, or we add more CO2 just from the passive influx of CO2 from the surface, that means that we can exacerbate these natural processes and lead to even more intense acidity and problems both with hypoxia and acidity. Now, kind of babbled away there, but I think you got the picture that there's a couple things going on here with ocean acidity. Um, so let's move on a little bit. And I mentioned that there have been that temporal series from the 80s showing here's what's going on with carbonate chemistry in the ocean, at least from a couple <laughs> sites. But there has, in 94, and then more recently, I think they're starting a new one, uh, international collaboration. These are just ship tracks all over the world ocean where they've gone out and said, okay, let's really quantify the carbonate chemistry of the oceans. And in the past, we couldn't do this very well. I'm not a marine chemist, I'm a biologist, but I've learned a lot about carbonate chemistry. And the methods that we use for carbonate chemistry now are very, very precise. And unlike global warming where you say, okay, it's warm by whatever, three degrees, you can't say, well, see that three degrees, here's the part right there that I can unambiguously say, this is due to our fossil fuel emissions. So there's a lot of argument about what the fossil fuel component of warming is in the atmosphere. But when it comes to ocean chemistry, that ambiguity is really gone. We can tell by the difference in the carbon isotopic composition, uh, the isotopic composition of carbon in fossil fuels compared to just natural carbon that's floating around. Um, we can discriminate those so well that we can identify very clearly, here's how much ocean acidity has changed and here's exactly how much is due to our fossil fuel emissions. And so from these surveys, they've been able to say, here is the fossil fuel inventory in the ocean. And about 41% of all of our emissions are now in the ocean. Um, and the reds are high, the blues are none. And you can see that it's really coming in from the surface. And there have been some people, if you look at some of the blogs, that say, oh, you know, this is a bunch of bull about ocean acidification. It's just hydrothermal vents spewing out CO2, and that's what's doing it. It's not. It's right here. And you can see in the North Atlantic, this is an area of bottom water formation where dense, cold, dense water is sinking, particularly in winter, that's carrying with it, or dragging along that CO2 from the surface. So it's penetrating to depth 3,000 meters much more quickly than you'd see, say, in the, the middle of the Pacific, where there isn't a downwelling of waters in those areas. This is a snapshot, and over time, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it. This is the Indian, so there's a little ship track through the ocean here. 
And this goes from zero to 3,000 meters deep from north to south, north on the left, south on the, I'm sorry, north on the right, south on the left. So it's just a, a section of each ocean. Um, if you looked at this picture 500 years from now, it would be more homogeneous because it takes about 500 years or so for the ocean to stir once. With water is sinking, it then flows south along the Atlantic and then spins around the Antarctic and comes up into the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. And so the water we have out here is really the oldest water in the sense that it hasn't touched the surface for that long. And you have to get near the surface or touch the surface to get any oxygen. That's where oxygen gets in and CO2 gets out, really. And so the, the Pacific, or the Atlantic rather, is very well oxygenated compared to the Pacific because all the way through this sort of long circuitous route of the, what they call the ocean conveyor, there's respiration going on. There's animals that are consuming oxygen to lower oxygen tensions and raise CO2 levels. So if you look at the pH of the Pacific, it's also about 0.2 units lower than, than is the Atlantic um, going on here. That's, so that's some background. Um, what happens when CO2 emissions get into the ocean? Um, there's not a lot of chemistry in the atmosphere. Most CO2 is just there as CO2 and, and oxygen is oxygen. There's a little bit of chemistry because similar things happen to water in the atmosphere as it does in the ocean. CO2 penetrates through the sea surface easily and it reacts with water to form carbonic acid, soda water. And that dissociates very quickly. This is the one chemistry slide. It dissociates very quickly and produces protons uh, I'm sorry, it produces uh, bicarbonate and protons, and that ends up reacting with, that proton reacts with a carbonate ion, calcium carbonate. These carbonate ions are essential for carbonate formation for all organisms. And they produce another bicarbonate. So when you add CO2, you get a lot of extra bicarbonate, I'm sorry, you get a lot of extra bicarbonate and a lot of extra protons, and you lose carbonate ions. And so one of the consequences is that it's a more acidic ocean. Another consequence is that there's not as much carbonate around for those organisms that really needed to build their skeletal elements. And corals, everything that uses that sort of skeleton. Um, so that's the chemistry lesson. And now one last slide, which I think this is a great slide because this really puts it into a context of long term. This is now 25 million years. Oops. And this is ocean pH. And these are estimates of ocean pH mainly from boron isotopes in uh, foraminiferal shells. And they can use those to estimate, I don't know how it's done, but it's used to estimate pH. And you can see that it's varied a lot through the last 25 million years. But basically, in a geologic instant, we are going to change the ocean to a, a world that is completely different than anything that's occurred for quite some time. And the real question is, what is that going to mean for ocean ecosystems. Um, if you change it slowly, maybe that would be okay because you give some organism scope for adaptation. Um, if you change it a little bit, maybe that's okay too because it's within the realm of the sort of physiological diversity those organisms have. But if you do both things at the same time, you change it a lot and you change it fast, that's kind of the most difficult thing to cope with. So um, in any environmental change. But we, we now have a research community that's going out trying to figure out well, what does this mean to organisms. Um, but I mentioned that these environmental changes really act on physiology, and that's that, that, that fundamental player and those adapta adaptations that organisms have that then lead to the sort of the performance of animals. How do animals perform in terms of their survival, growth, and reproduction that plays into their own population dynamics, whether they're going to have a rising population with lots of productivity, or they're going to slow down because they're spending all their time either dying or coping with stress. And whatever, however the population performs, that leads to what goes on in food webs. There's going to be some, some organisms that are losers with ocean acidification, warming, hypoxia, but there's going to be some winners too. And what it, it doesn't, that doesn't balance it out necessarily, it might. But what it does mean is that it's going to be disruptive for energy flow through food webs. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then, of course, then plays right into the things that society wants to know something about. Now, if you think about this as a research program, this is the easy end, and this is the difficult end. It's, it's very, and this is what I do mainly, and it's easiest to take an animal, throw him in a jar, and make him a little cynic, and then see if he dies, or how he performs physiologically. It's much more difficult to see how does that change in physiology scale up to all these other things that are, that are far more difficult to get at in an experimental setting. 
And so there, we're trying, we as a research community, are trying to kind of move our efforts down this road a little bit. Um, so how do animals cope with this? Uh, you can do a few things. You can just say, well, for a fish or for a population that recruits differently, your larvae can go and land somewhere more appropriate or you can just swim to another spot. You can acclimate or acclimatize to it. And if some of your population is intolerant, they won't be reproducing anymore. And if there are tolerant parts of the population, they'll reproduce and you'll have eventually adaptation if the tolerant groups can then reproduce. And extinction is certainly a possibility and is actually the rule in nature for, you know, in the long run. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, there's a few little vignettes that I'm gonna talk about warming, a couple little cases, and then eventually I'm gonna work my way into acidification a little more. So what happens on the, our coast, I was involved in a study in the 90s where we, we uh, knew of uh, Hewitt, this was a guy at Hawkins Marine Station that was a student in the 30s, and we had his thesis and we know that he put in some bolts along the inner tidal here and we said, well, let's get a metal detector and see if we can find those bolts. So we went out one night at low tide and Rafe Sangerin, Sarah Gilman, and Chuck Baxter and I went out and found three or four of his bolts. Fortunately, it was granite, so they're still there. And we were able to replicate exactly his transect where he put down 108 one-yard square plots and then counted all of the animals that were in his plots. He didn't record the algae, he recorded the animals. And so we replicated it and then we divided we looked at his data versus ours, and we divided the number of species that were abundant enough into southern species that live mainly south of Monterey, northern species that live mainly north of Point Conception, and cosmopolitan species that lived everywhere, and then tried to evaluate so several hypotheses that could explain the pattern we saw. The pattern was northern species became less abundant, southern species became more abundant, and cosmopolitan species didn't do much at all. And we thought, well, is this because of a change in predators? Because sea, urchin, sea otters had to come back into the area? Or was it um, storminess or temperature or whatever? The only thing we couldn't exclude was climate warming. So this was actually a fairly early paper that showed that one of the predictions of climate warming, that you warm the globe and animals' ranges move northward or poleward, this was one set of data that was consistent with that hypothesis. And since that time, there have been lots of studies that have shown that, including Sally Holbrook's work in the Channel Islands, that I'm sure some of you are aware of, where northern species have gone down in abundance with a corresponding rise in the abundance of some of the southern species. So that's, and, and warming is something we, Romich and McGowan published a couple papers about the California current zooplankton and, and variety of changes that are associated with differences in environmental conditions offshore on the coast. Uh, now I'll go on to hypoxia a little bit. How does hypoxia, Nancy Rabelais has, works in Louisiana and does a lot of work on the Gulf of Mexico or the Mississippi dead zone. And by dead zone, they usually don't mean there's zero oxygen. oxygen. It just means it's very low. And what a dead zone is, is, is not defined well. It, some people say it's 1.4 milliliters per liter or less. That's about 62 micromolar. Some people say it's 100 micromolars or less, or 50 micromolars. There's just a zone in there where people say it's stressful. But what happens when you look at the variety of organisms that live in the ocean? Um, the more complicated organisms have to have more oxygen in general because they have more complicated physiological machinery, um, which allows them to be more tolerant of some things but less tolerant of others. Fish, mobile inverts, sort of disappear first. As you go into lower and lower oxygen, they become they start to drop out first, and then you end up getting to an area where you're just dead. Um, the zones we have offshore in California are sort of in, in this range right now, one. Now, or, or less. And I'll show you a little bit of our work first. This is my little vignette on here's what kind of work I'm doing on both acidification and hypoxia for some animals that live offshore. And one of the things we're concerned with are urchins. Um, we're focusing on them right now, and these are fragile urchins, Strongylus and Trotus fragilis, which is a deep water congeneric, or congener of the red and purple urchins that you guys are familiar with in shallow water. So we're first working on this deep water urchin, and we look at how well it can regulate its acid-base balance under CO2 or hypoxia or both, and also changes in metabolic rates, and then we're going to compare that with purpuratus, the shallow purple region. So what we do is, this is a picture, a little movie, of our benthic respiration system. And all that runs, just get your attention over here on the right a little bit. This is oxygen 
off our coast. The, the green is actually in the Atlantic, lots more oxygen, and the Pacific is here, and the eastern Pacific along our coast is here. This is right in the oxygen minimum zone where all the productivity at the surface sinks down and then is remineralized. This system is it's on something called a benthic elevator. We throw this over the side of the ship, it sinks to the bottom, and we have all these little metabolic chambers. These are just basically glass chambers. And there's a bag here that's gas tight. It's a mylar bag. In this case, it's filled with oxygen saturated seawater. And the oxygen tension right here is really low. It's only five micromoles per liter, or 10, five to 10. It's really low um, oxygen. And we slurp up these little animals, put them in the chambers, and then we close them up with the ROV. And it's always, we're trying to make sure we don't hurt the animals when we slurp them up. You sort of think about using an ROV, it's kind of like thinking about having your, your two-year-old ask your two-year-old to go over and make toast for you. Um, it, it's difficult to get it to work right sometimes. And then we get them in the chambers, and this is where my heart rate goes up, because I don't want to break my chambers with that thing. And the arm sometimes has this epileptic fit that starts going like this. Um, and this part's plastic, but this is quartz glass that costs about $1,000. And so we close these chambers, and then we fly away. And this system runs for about a month. And what it does, in this case, there are eight chambers. We load them all up. And they're all programmed a little bit differently. But they go for about six hours with the chambers closed. And that they're just consuming oxygen, just like if you put a bug in a jar. Slowly but surely, it's going to drop the oxygen tensions in the jar. And then after about six hours, a pump comes on and flushes that chamber out, with, so it renews the water inside. And so we fly away, and I'll show you a little data here. Um, so this is data from one of those chambers. So we come down, here's high oxygen at the surface, comes down, sorry, there's a little bit of a mix of units in these slides. This isn't the 1.4 level, this is micromolar. So it's low oxygen would be about here. So this is normal oxygen in that region. We go for about six hours, pump the chamber, oxygen's consumed, we pump the chamber, oxygen's consumed, and we take the slope of that line to figure out what's the rate of oxygen consumption for whatever the body mass of that animal was. And then after we get that for about six or eight times, that kind of gives us what's the background rate, normal rate for this animal. And then we started injecting extra oxygen into the chambers, where instead of having its normal five to 10 micromolar, now we've got this one up near 50, 30 to 50. And then we do that for a while to see how its metabolic rate may respond to changes in oxygen tensions. And we do this for a bunch of different levels and a bunch of different animals. And if you sort of sum that all up, this is kind of a summary of what you get. If this is the level of oxygen in the chamber, so this is kind of ambient down here near 5 to 10, their metabolic rates were roughly, each red co each color is an animal, their metabolic rates were roughly around 3, say. You give those animals that are really living in the core of the oxygen minimum zone more oxygen, they use it. They're, they're happy to have that more, more oxygen. And so their metabolic rates go up to a point. Now, some animals can't even live in this area to begin with. But these animals in particular, this urchin, it lives right through the oxygen minimum zone. That's pretty much the core of its distribution. But even at the core of its distribution, we know that it's stressed. So what does that mean for the population? Um, and by the way, uh, I don't show you these data, but we've done exactly the same thing with CO2. And with CO2, we don't get the same shape, but basically metabolic rates go down as pH goes down. So you give them more acidic water, their metabolic rates slow down. Metabolic rates or oxygen consumption rates tell us a lot about how animals behave or how, how animals perform. We, if you limit the amount of oxygen we can consume, obviously we, can't, we won't have the aerobic scope that we have now. You can't go out and run a marathon if you say, give me one of your lungs, or if oxygen tensions in the atmosphere were half what they are now. Um, it means they can only grow so much, they can only reproduce so much, they can only metabolic, metabolize so much food. So if you're living right in the core of the OMZ, you may be able to live there, but you're probably growing more slowly, producing fewer larvae, and contributing to the population dynamics of, of the entire species in a much smaller way than those individuals that are living a little bit shallower at higher oxygen levels, or a little bit even deeper at higher oxygen levels. So, so that, that's one way of telling us that this is constraining for that population. As we move to the future in the bigger picture, animals are probably going to have a harder time still as oxygen tensions go down. Now, at the same time, as oxygen tensions are going down, CO2 is going up. So part of this story could also be CO2, not just oxygen. So now I'm going to deal more with ocean acidification. 
and talk a little bit about the types of stresses that occur for, for most animals that are exposed to ocean acidification. And it can affect a variety of metabolic processes like photosynthesis. And there have been some meta-analyses of all the literature saying, okay, what does the literature tell us about photosynthesis or some of these other items? And the literature, this is just a nice view of a vampire squid swimming along, so it keeps you entertained while I'm out of the way. Um, photosynthesis is, affects some respond positively. More CO2, they might be CO2 limited, just like some plants are light limited. So you give them CO2 and they grow faster. In general, blue-green algae do better, or cyanobacteria do better with more CO2, but not all species have done. A few studies have shown that it's variable, but in general they do better. Other species don't do as well. Some coccolithophores, which are these little microscopic um, phytoplankters that are about a third of the major phytoplankton producers in the world ocean, they form calcium carbonate tests, or coccoliths, and they tend to do worse. So the jury's not really in on what the net result's going to be in the ocean, although it looks like there's going to be a big shift in the composition of phytoplankton communities in the ocean as we acidify the oceans. Calcification is another one, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. I think I put a slide in, it's a little complicated, but um, calcification is probably the best known uh, physiological process related to ocean acidification, and in general, the literature shows that it is that acidification impairs calcification in, in most organisms. There are a few exceptions, and Justin Rees at uh, UI, I think, published a paper a few years ago where he had about 18 species and showed that some crustaceans in particular actually grew faster under high CO2 loads, which was very interesting to the scientist community because to that point, we didn't think anything was really going to do well in terms of CO2. Um, but in general, it's negative for most organisms. Respiration is another one. Animals like this, or like us, any animal that has a respiratory protein, all of those respiratory proteins behave the same way. We breathe in our lungs. The lungs are a high pH area of our, t of our bodies. Hemoglobin grabs oxygen. It has a very high affinity for oxygen at a high pH. That's carried out to our tissues, just like it is for that vampire squid. And in our tissues, where our muscles are producing CO2 and consuming oxygen, they're more acidic than our lungs, and the Bohr effect, if you know what that is, if you acidify a respiratory protein, its affinity for oxygen is reduced. So they let, that's where it lets go of that oxygen, which is essential. If the hemoglobin wanted to hold on to it, we wouldn't have it available for metabolism. So if you, for us, no big deal, because we've kind of partitioned where the high and low pH parts of our bodies are. But if you put this animal into a, uh, now an ocean that's more acidic, that CO2 is going to go right through its tissues it will acidify its tissues and sort of lower the whole CO2 story for the animal or the whole pH story. So its tissues where it's exchanging gases will be higher in CO2, lower in pH. And then to maintain that gradient so it can now release the oxygen in bound, they have hemocyanin, um, then its tissues are going to have to be even lower pH. And so you can maybe be able to shift this whole thing downward so that you have kind of lower pH in general but even lower pH in your tissues so you get this gradient from your gas exchange surface down to your um, tissues. But can you then cope with things like acid-base balance? It, it might disrupt other things that are going on. So respiration is another one. I spent more time than I wanted on that. Acid-base balance is one that I work on a fair amount. And this, I think, is actually the root of all evil and, or all good, if you want. Because all of our, all the animals that are around there have to maintain some acid-base balance. Not all do, but most do, because all of our enzymes are tuned to pH ranges. And they work most effectively at a particular pH range. So if you take a, an enzyme and put it in a different pH, its activity, how fast it will help things react, slows down. And if your enzymes aren't working properly, which are really catalysts for a variety of, of metabolic functions in your body, then you're going to slow down protein synthesis and all the other things that go on with your lives. Now, that's for animals that are complex animals like us. All organisms have some sort of enzyme systems. But some animals or organisms have much broader pH optima for their enzymes. And we don't know much about this at all. But there are some groups that just sort of tolerate whatever the conditions are. They may or may not be more susceptible to changes in pH that will occur in the future. But for organisms like this squid or for us, We'll, if we undergo some sort of acid-based disturbance, we go out and run a marathon or exercise, we work really hard to restore normal conditions in our bodies. 
and we'll spend a lot of energy doing that. So we will, um, initially if CO2 goes into your body, we have bicarbonate will go up very rapidly. We'll just raise bicarbonate levels and try to buffer the changes in our body and restore that pH to where it was. And this, then we'll start pumping protein, protons out of our cells. And we'll do that using ion exchangers, some of which are energetically very expensive. They cost a lot of energy, but we'll sit there and pump those protons because we want very badly to restore that acid-base balance in our tissues so that we can reach uh, optimal performance again. And this is true for a lot of higher animals, including squids, crabs, mollusks of all sorts. Metabolism to another one. And I already showed you a little bit of data on hypoxia, but the same sort of thing has occurred. Acidification can affect metabolism in a variety of ways. A lot of it is linked, acid-base balance is sort of linked to metabolism, it's linked to respiration, it's certainly linked to calcification and probably to photosynthesis. Um, so what is that? I mean, you've got all these stresses and it's affecting what's going on physiological, physiologically with an organism, but what does it really mean to the sort of the performance of that animal, the, the metabolic performance, if you will? Um, if, and you can sort of think of it as an energy budget or it, even an in, our income. You know, I get a salary and I, I spend a lot on the cost of living. I spend a bunch on, on my mortgage and on, on buying food and just sort of the day-to-day the -day cost of living. And if I have some extra income, I'll spend it on well, toys and vacations and school for my child, if it's whatever. Animals, of course, are going to spend their excess on reproduction and growth. And if you increase this, this cost of living because this animal is stressed, then all of a sudden the cost of acid-base balance goes up, perhaps. That may be one cost. And they can either increase the size of the pie, take in more food, and then allocate a lot of energy to that acid-base compensation so that they can still grow or reproduce. Or if they can't really increase the size of the pie, something's got to give. And what's going to give, either they don't survive or growth and reproduction are going to re be reduced. And that means then they're probably, they may not grow as fast, they may not get as big, they may not live as long. And for a population then that plays into there aren't as many in the population, they're not as resilient to disturbances so they can't come back as easily. And they may not be as productive as they were when everybody was growing optimally. Now on the other hand, if you're a winner and environmental changes are beneficial, then it may actually reduce the cost of living and then you flourish. So both of those things are going to go on, and the science community would really like to figure out where does the balance lie, what's going to happen ultimately. This is a little bit of a complicated slide. I want to talk about corals just a little bit. We don't have many here, but we do have some corals. And coral reefs are one system that are really in trouble in terms of environmental changes. But this is a complicated graph about calcification in corals. It's sort of a model of how it grows. But basically, forget almost all of this, and just look at this section. Here's the coral skeleton, the calcium carbonate. Here's the overlying tissue. And what corals do is they invaginate a little bit of their tissue and then enclose some seawater. So basically they're in an ocean, but they make a little pond. And then once they've got that pond, they start pumping protons out of that pond. And they use these ion exchangers to remove protons so that they can raise the pH to a level that then they can form calcium carbonate. And it's basically they're just changing chemistry. And the farther they have to change the proton concentrations, the more costly it is. So if you start in a low pH ocean, it costs a lot to pump all those protons out. If the ocean's a high pH ocean, like it used to be, or is now in some areas, then it doesn't cost as much to do that. Sort of an, anal an analogy would be, you're going to boil water. If you start with really warm water and, and ice, you don't have to add as much heat to the warm water to get it to boiling as you do the ice. It's just as simple as that. It's, it's, it's thermodynamics, right? So that's one of the reasons that most organisms that have calcium carbonate skeletal elements calcify less in a lower pH ocean because they can't or don't allocate as much energy to it. There are exceptions to that. Cuttlefish and a few other things like crustaceans. The crustacean story is a funny one. I don't understand it yet. But some animals do actually put more energy into calcification. So what does this mean for corals? You've probably heard about coral bleaching. I'm not going to show any slides about it. But you warm corals, the zooxanthellae leave, corals die after a few weeks and they can recover, but they also suffer from low acidity. And this is a shot of aragonite saturation. Aragonite is one form of calcium carbonate. Basically think of this as um, the measure of how many carbonate ions are around. So lots of carbonate ions, four, five, and six, 
fewer carbon anions to the left. And this is the rate of calcification for this one species of coral. And you can see that when there's a lot of carbonate available, it calcifies very quickly and grows fast. When you get down to around two or three, it's not calcifying as much anymore. Now, there's a lot of concern about tipping points in various ecosystems with relation to environmental changes in general. But coral reefs, there's a, there are a few reports now that think, well, maybe we're reaching a tipping point somewhere between 350 and 450 parts per million in the atmosphere. And the reason there's concern for that is both because of warming and this sort of double whammy that when you add that much CO2, you've moved the saturation state for aragonite down, and you're not allowing the corals to have enough carbonate ions. And you were going to go from something like this healthy reef to a transitional reef to eventually an algal-dominated turf or system without corals. And maybe this will be just fine, but it may, we're going to change the world. Maybe we just, we're not going to like this very much, though, in some ways. And clearly, the biodiversity that goes along with coral reefs is going to change when you have an algal dominated community. So to illustrate this, Ken Caldera put these together. This is a shot of the world at 280 parts per million. And if you take all of the existing coral reefs, which are all of these purple dots, shallow water reefs, these, for each reef, they said, okay, what is the aragonite, or aragonite saturation state, or how many carbonate ions are around? And five is high, zero is really low. This is basically also a pH scale. This is a high pH, and the left is low pH. But this is a frequency histogram of what the existing reefs were at that concentration in the atmosphere. They were all in nice, optimal growth conditions. And as we move through the century, now, today, it's starting to go down a little bit. And through the century, 550, 650, 750, I think it goes to 850. Oh, no, it doesn't. Can we go back? Um, here we are toward the end of the century, and now you can see that all of the locations where currently coral reefs are found are suboptimal for coral growth. And so this is a really doomsday story, but it doesn't look good for the corals. And unless we're going to change how we deal with CO2 in the atmosphere, this is almost inevitable if everything we know about coral biology is correct right now. Now the hope is that there are species that can acclimate to these new warm conditions, uh, corrosive conditions. And it is shown that some can, but it looks like there's going to be a change in the composition of reefs. Yes, by the way, I meant to, if you ever have questions, just interrupt me. Yes. I'm just thinking here on the West Coast, we have our deep sea coral populations that we're currently trying to massacre in different sanctuaries. Right. This might be our story to tell. And mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting questions and I don't know what your if you have some insight into this is Sort of, it seems like they are surviving at the below the aragonite horizon or the, the saturation level. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, what does that mean to the story of corals potentially? That's a great question. Um, we do have corals out here. We have deep water corals. Um, we don't have. There's only one or two aragonite. So they're a little bit about aragonite. Aragonite is one crystalline form of calcium carbonate. There's another form called calcite, which is less. Um, Aragonite is one of the most um, easily dissolved carbonate forms. There's, there's a few crystalline forms of car calcium carbonate, but calcite and aragonite are the two dominant forms. Anything that lives in corrosive waters, like most of the deep water corals, and almost all of ours are uh, Gorgonians, they have calcite and not aragonite. There is one species called Lophelia, or genus called Lophelia, that is all over the Atlantic, down to deep depths. But it's only found out here at depths down to around 230 meters. Because if you get to, uh, I don't have, it's too bad I don't have that graph, but if you look through, I've shown you this going to redder, 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 red meaning it's low saturation. This is the surface of the ocean, but if I did the same thing for deep water, the deep water is already undersaturated in the Pacific. <clears throat> because I mentioned as that water goes from the Atlantic and sinks and comes all the way over here after about 500 years, it's got a lot of CO2 in it. And the, the aragonite saturation boundary, if you get below one on this, that means that seawater is corrosive enough that exposed aragonite will start to dissolve. If you're above one, you can make aragonite and it won't dissolve if it's staying there, it's stable. But under one, it'll dissolve. So much of where do you reach one as you go deeper in the water? About 500 meters or less off this coast, you reach one. And so anything below that, you don't find carbonate Material. Yes? Is the scarcity, a relative scarcity of lophelia, perhaps an indication of 
you know, we're well into a, a long trend of, um, well, of this. Yeah, well, that long trend is a little bit unclear because if you think about ocean circulation, over the last how many 40, 50 million years, it's been kind of what it is now. And over that time period, this setting has changed somewhat in terms of what is, how corrosive have the waters been off our coast during that period. It's changed with ice ages, it's changed with a variety of factors that have affected environmental conditions. But in terms of human history, my guess is it hasn't changed very much. And we're just now getting to the point where we're going to see things change a little bit as we add more and more CO2 and as we add um, nutrients to the surface. Because if you, part of that is, is this long circuitous route that water takes to get here over 500 years. But another important part of the story is how much organic material is raining down on that. So if you have all this organic stuff raining down, a lot of CO2 is going to be produced right where you are. And that's going to make it more corrosive. And if you look at what these corrosive water events, we didn't really think that they hit the shore. But I'll talk a little bit later. I don't have many slides on it, but there's upwelling that brings that low oxygen water from beneath the shelf up onto the shore. We've seen these, death, these dead zones in Oregon. And even in, right in Monterey, we're starting to measure CO2 gets to really low levels. The surface is around 7.9, something like that, 8.0 in Monterey. But we get 7.6 events that hit, hit the shore because of this water that's coming up from deep water over the shelf. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Yes? Please, I'm sorry to allow Oh, please. I'm, I'm um, glad you're interested. I... Arthur Davidson. Yes. Um, it's not, I'm very looking at, I don't know if it's Paragorgia or another coral down there. Yes, we are. And Paragorgia is, there, is one. Okay. So has there any, is it too new or is there anything that's come out of those studies yet? Oh, too new. We've done, well, I'm going back out there next month. Um, but we, Andrew de Vogelaire okay. and I, and some others on the cruise set up a transect where we want to look at changes in Paragorgia. And we actually tried to bring Paragorgia to the surface and then label them a little bit with calcine, which is a compound that will be late. It's a fluorescent compound that you can, if you grow a shell, it'll incorporate it into the calcium carbonate. And if you then collect that animal later, shine a black light on it, it'll fluoresce where it laid down that carbonate. So you can kind of label something to see how fast it's grown. Paragorgia is not the best because they actually have these funny crystalline this funny crystalline structure. But we thought we'd try it. We're going to go try it again, actually. So. Is anyone doing, I did my grad work in the public name, is anyone doing comparisons or trying to do the same kind of study in the shallower waters with the deep water plugs out there? Um, there are some people looking at, Lophelia is a really um, a high priority taxon. And we've tried to do this with Lophelia as well. We just haven't been able to collect it yet. It lives in Monterey Bay. I, I know I've seen it. I have some locations. We want to actually collect it and put it in deeper water and just do a controlled experiment a little bit to see if it'll even live if we put it deeper. Right. Other people are bringing it into the lab. It works. It lives really well in the lab. I haven't brought it in, but some of my colleagues have, and they're growing it. And there's one paper that's come out showing you acidify the water and Lophelia doesn't do well. And so if you look... Sort of in the big picture, Bob, it's Bob, isn't it? So you asked about depth. Here, it's about 500 meters to get to 1.0 in the Pacific here. If you go to the Atlantic, it's 24, 2,500 meters. You're way down there. But if you look at the projections for the future, the, this aragonite, they call this the aragonite saturation boundary, where it goes to 1. That boundary is going to get shallower and shallower. And it's coming up at something like, 12 meters a year or a meter a year. They can measure chemistry so well it's happening. But in the Atlantic, it's going to come way up. It's going to change a lot in the Atlantic in ways that, that are already occurring in the Pacific. So I think the real changes for corals are going to be in the Atlantic for deep water corals. Mm -hmm. Yes? So the, the corals in shallow waters, do they use carbonite because that's the most abundant type of carbonate in those waters or because it's more energetically? Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, if you look at Earth history, there are periods in Earth history that are called aragonite seas versus calcite seas. And in general, more acidic times are considered calcite seas because aragonite just dissolves more easily. Um, and then there's also a third type that I didn't mention, which is called calcite with more magnesium embedded in it. And high magnesium calcite is actually more soluble than even aragonite. Um, but I, I don't know why some lay down aragonite, but the scleractinian corals, which are really the corals that are found in all tropical coral reefs, they're pretty much aragonitic corals. But almost all the gorgonians 
mussels, um, a lot of the mollusks are cassitic. So they won't ship? They, 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 don't, they don't tend to ship, but some have both. And they also form this other thing called amorphous calcium carbonate, I think it's called. And that's hard, this really un disorganized structure that dissolves very easily. And a lot of larvae actually form that. Oh, should I go on? Yes, go ahead. I mean, as many questions as you want. It's delightful to so, babble away. <laughs> well, I didn't mean it. I'm curious that about the, the calcite, the organisms sure. that use calcite, and mm -hmm. what are the pH ranges where they can continue to build? Well, right now, it, you could just change this to calcite here, because the same, you can calculate the calcite saturation, um, or calcite saturation from an omega for calcite or omega for aragonite. And the calcite saturation boundary in the Pacific right now, and I calculated this just a couple weeks ago, it's around 2,500 or 3,000 meters. So you've got to go a lot deeper, a lot more CO2, before you get to the point where it's acidic enough to dissolve calcite. And, but, but then when you start adding magnesium to that calcite, it's sort of a gradient. The more magnesium you add, the more soluble it is. And it gets closer and closer to aragonite in terms of solubility. And why animals make one or the other, uh, I'm sorry, I can't comment on very much. So, kind of a big picture again in terms of time. This is now 400, I switched the axes. There's the present over there, and this is 480 million years ago. So this is most of the, the Phenozoic. And what we see is that as we go through time, there are reefs. And these are kind of the reefs in the fossil record, coral reefs. And what we see is that they disappear at these big, these are the black bars of five largest major mass extinctions that are, that are recorded in Earth history. The very biggest is the Ampermian extinction, where roughly, nine, you know, all these estimates of how much life died, but basically about 95% of life on Earth disappeared at that time. And this was related to massive volcanism in Siberia, called the Siberian Traps, where for about 100,000 years or more, it just there was massive volcanism that injected lots and lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, as well as other things. Um, so at that time, we also know now, based on a paper that was published by Jonathan Payne at Stanford just last year, that undeniably showed that this was a period where ocean acidification occurred, based on cal or calcium isotope analysis. But these reefs ended during those periods, and so life disappeared. And you know, if you get a new name, you know something went really bad right here, because if they change, the geologists changed the name, it really means there was a big change. So. Something biologically bad had to happen wherever there's a line. Um, so that meant that everything kind of died out here. But if you, at some point it recovered. Life flourished again. And there's a lot of diversification that occurs after these extinctions. In fact, the highest um, diversification rates occur after each of these extinctions. But it's not correlated with the time of the extinction. The highest correlation occurs 10 million years after the extinction. That's when you get the, the most rapid diversification. So what this means is that, in terms of the Earth, don't worry about nature, because it's going to come back. You know, we, don't, we can't do much that's going to harm it, because we've had all these other catastrophes. But it does mean that if you want to come back, you're going to have to wait about 10 million years. <laughs> and it's true if you look at corals, too. For the coral record, it, the corals recover, but they recover anywhere from 400,000 years to something like 2 to 4 million years before they started coming back again. And that, so, so it's, it's a... I mean, what we're doing now, if this is really the sixth major mass extinction, which some of the, some people, in fact, Charlie Barone, who made this um, graph, thinks that we are now in the middle of the sixth major mass extinction, and ocean acidification is going to play a big part of it. Um, if that's true, we'll get things back, but it's going to be well beyond our children's lives, and it's a, so it's a big deal. And it, uh, one of the messages, I think, in terms of, because, you know, I usually just deal here so it's the sciences, and I, I love this because it's kind of drifting into policy in the public, which is one of the things that's most important. And I get the sense that people think, oh, climate change is going to happen, there's nothing we can do about it, so why worry? But it's, I think the point we have to make is it's not if climate change occurs, it's how far down that road we go. The more climate change we see, the more impactful it will be on our lives and our children's lives. So we've got to do something to minimize climate change. We're not going to stop it. But we can do our best to adapt to it and to minimize how far down the warming road we go. That's my soapbox for it. Um, so 
this is, I work on deep water communities a lot, so I'm concerned with the deep sea. And what I've done here is I've taken the, I showed you that graph with all the ship tracks all over the world for the ocean circulation and ocean carbonate chemistry. I took all those data for the Pacific and I plotted them here. 6,000 meters at the bottom, zero at the top, and this is the pH scale, 6.8, 8.2. The different colors are just different parts of the Pacific, but basically that is the envelope of existing pH data for the Pacific. It's highly variable at the surface because that's where you get CO2 tape drawdown during phytoplankton blooms and CO2 increase during a respiration event. And if it, if deep water, it doesn't change quite as much. But basically, this is the future. We're going to shift it over by about 0.4 units, and it's not going to happen quite like that. It's going to happen at the surface and slowly penetrate to death. But you can see that in the surface waters, if we do get about a 0.4 unit change, which we expect by the end of this century, um, there's still some overlap with the existing pH distribution. But if you look at deep water, if eventually this is what turns out. We're going to be sort of asking the deep water organisms to live in a system or an environment that is completely foreign to what they've experienced through much of their evolutionary history, or at least through their recent evolutionary history. And again, the question is, are they going to be able to handle it? Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence now that shows that they can't handle it as well. They have low metabolic rates, mainly because it's colder down there. They have low enzyme functions because there's less energy down there. There's, they're adapted to sort of low energy life cycles or lifestyles. So that if they have an acidotic event, now they're in an ocean that's acidic, they can't really spend extra energy just pumping protons because they don't have that much extra energy to, lay, to, to, to um, put toward that. So what am I doing? This is another little vignette of here's what I do. Um, I mentioned we're working on this, this animal. But we've also done some work comparing the tanner crab, which lives off our coast here in shoals as you get north, to the dungeness crab. And so we've taken tanner crabs and dungeness crab, which we've all seen more like this, um, <laughs> and used those. They're, they're not even in the same family, but they're two big crabs, decapod crabs, so we thought they're easy to get. We can actually just go buy these and we can go out and suck these up. You saw that little slurp gun we used, the urchins? We would just put it right on his back and slurp it up and hold it and then drop it into a, our, our, our system. And we put them in the aquarium, and in this case, what we're looking at is acid-base balance. And I'm not going to take too much time explaining this, because it's sort of, this is called a Davenport diagram, and it's something that, even at a physiology meeting, usually people say, you showed a Davenport diagram? <laughs> and so what it, what it basically is, is we took an animal, and we put it under a very high CO2 load, 10,000 parts per million, which is way above anything we do. And we just did that for 24 hours. And then every time period, 0.4 hours, 0.8 hours, up to 24 hours later, we said, how well did it, did it do? And basically, this is the pH scale here, going from high pH to low pH. What you want to do is you, you put an animal in high CO2, and it starts breathing that, that low pH water, and it, goes, it becomes acidotic. Its tissues become acidified because it's breathing lots of CO2. It says, oh, geez, this is a bad thing. I want to get back to where I was in terms of pH. So it wants to get back on this line in pH. So what it tries to do is, at first it raises carbonate levels, bicarbonate levels in its tissues, and then it starts to spend energy pumping protons and doing what it can to bring its pH of its tissues back toward this origination point. And that's called pH compensation. And the Dungeness crab, we threw it in there, and it said, oh, no problem. And after 24 hours, even with this immense CO2 load, it came back. It's a very high metabolism animal, and animals like that, us, fish, have great adaptations that allow us to deal with an acidotic event. So if we run down the street, we get acidotic, we start breathing hard, we pump our blood starts pumping, we've got great gas exchange capacity, we deal with it. But the Dungeness crab, it became acidotic, and after 24 hours, it hardly came back at all. So. This one's worse than that one. The deep water crab is worse. Now, I won't show you any more data, but I will tell you that this experiment was done under surface oxygen tensions, really high oxygen. And this animal actually lives in low oxygen. Um, we put this animal under low oxygen, and it did nothing. It just was flat. So if you have, and the implication for that was that if you have just acidosis going on, maybe the animal can cope with it as long as it's got energy to deal with it. But if you have acidosis and you have a hypoxic event at the same time, it's a double whammy for an organism that's trying to cope with that physiologically. So those things could be either additive 
or they could be synergistic where you have both of them and it's worse than if you just had both of them or each one separately added together. And in some cases, they can be antagonistic. One may one stress may actually offset the other and make it better. So it's, it's hard to know. We, we, we're trying to look at that now. Um, so that's, that's the physiology. Now, I've been going along for a while. I want to spend a little bit of time before I finish on the California current system. Some of this is mine, some isn't. But California current, as you know, is very much like a variety of upwelling systems over the globe. And they all are similar in some ways. One that's really important, I'll mention off Peru, is, is interesting in this context. Um, and I'll mention that in a few minutes. But they're, as, you, as it shows here, they're highly productive. They're not very big, but they're, there's, that's where all of our, our fisheries come from, are these upwelling zones. That really contributes a significant amount because they're so productive. So what does this mean in terms of, what does climate change and all these things that go along with it mean to these coastal ecosystems? Well, first of all, we have to know what, what are those changes. There's going to be a, a acidification. These are things that we are driving, but they're also driven by natural processes as well. There's a lot of global change, and there's a lot of natural variation, especially in these coastal ecosystems. Um, it's going to affect these things that I'm not going to talk about today at all. Um, but if you take Francisco Chavez, who is down the hall from me, and Gerard Friedrich is down the other hall, they measure CO2 in the ocean, in the upper ocean a lot, and they've taken ship tracks. Do you know the Cal Coffee program? Okay, so one of the Cal Coffee lines, I think it's line 67, starts in Moss Landing and goes off. So they've run the Cal Coffee line 67 a lot of times, and they have an underway CO2 system in the ship. So they're measuring CO2, and this goes from zero to 300 kilometers offshore. And all I want to show here is that if you're within about 125 kilometers of the coast, you're in this coastal zone that's highly dynamic in terms of its CO2. And as you know, CO2, if it's high, that means that, that it's outgassing and there's, it, there's not a lot of productivity going on if it's super high. If it's really low, beneath the average, that means that this is a phytoplankton bloom down here. Because that's when phytoplankton pull CO2 in and draw down CO2 in the water. And in general, oops, in general, CO2 is higher here than it is offshore, and this upwelling that occurs here means that there's, this is probably upwelling that occurs here as well. Their CO2 is actually leaving the ocean and going into the atmosphere, rather than most of this world where CO2 is entering the, atmosphere, entering the ocean. So, the, if you look over time and space in these, these systems, you can see that there are these things called, you've heard of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, where there's these long-term changes in conditions, and um, we have things that said warm phases versus cold phases, and obviously it depends on where you are, uh, but on the California coast, a cold phase would, would be going on now, and a warm phase was, say, between 1976 and 2000, where it's warmer than normal. And during those warm periods, this is the PDO, it's cold, warm, cold, warm, and the, the communities respond to that. Zooplankton during a cool period is higher than it is in a warm period. I can't even read what that one is. Oh, this core organ coho salmon varies with it, as do copepods. So ecosystem dynamics are tracking these environmental changes. And those are going on without regard to what we are super, superimposing upon that with climate change. And so the question is, we know that this is occurring, all these changes are happening, but will this long-term climate change driven by our CO2 emissions sort of trump what's going on with this natural variation, or will it just be a little blip? And that's something we, I don't think we don't this, really Isn't know. it true that the decadal oscillation is sort of speeding up? I mean, we're getting, it's cycling up much more quickly now, much more irregularly. I, I don't know the answer to that. Francisco might know. I think certainly, the big change was in 1976, things started getting warm. And then it looked like there was a regime shift toward the end of the last century. And the problem with these regime shifts is you can't see them until you've passed them. Um, just like tipping points in ecosystems, you can't, you really don't know until, oops, yeah. Um, it was pretty dramatic. I remember the last big El Nino event of 97, 98, where there was just this huge change in the recruitment of rockfish and it was amazing just all the new recruits of different species that were occurring. Yeah. And the kelp rebounded so quickly as well. Uh, oh, yeah, it was, I agree. I, yeah. It, 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 it was just like, it was like a point in time and boom, just 
Yeah, and so, and I didn't talk about El Ninos, but of course they're superimposed here as well. It used to be you'd get a big El Nino every 12 years or so, and some minor ones in between. But now, the, especially in the 90s, the frequency of those really yeah. increased. And the PDO, I think you might be right, it might have shortened. Yeah. Um, so that happens, and just a little bit more about that. So we had a cool period in 2002, where it's cool on the coast, and there's immense productivity in 2002 in terms of phytoplankton maintenance. But a warm year, 2005, showed us that there was much less productivity, just kind of what you expect. Warm water, less productivity on our coast. If you move up to the bearing and you warm the water, you actually get more productivity because the problem here is nutrient limitation when you have warm water. The problem in the north is the water's cold throughout and so the, the plankton are overmixed and when you warm the water, you actually keep the plankton up where they need to be near in the light. Um, and I, I won't talk about that. So what, ha what does that mean when we have these changes in, in these conditions for this ecosystem? And some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this because you've read from, from PRDO. But this is Ox, Oclets on the feral nesting success. In 2005, 2006, those warm years, there was a, a failure of breeding that was related to resource limitation. So was it, was it just warm water that contributed to that, that led to low copepod growth or low phytoplankton growth, or was there something else going on? And the something else could also be uh, low oxygen. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about California current and, and, uh, and low oxygen. This is from Monterey Bay. This is Bruce Robeson's work at Ambari, where the, the shoaling of the OMZ is evident in Monterey Bay. You can see that this is from 1990 to the present. You can see that this sort of boundary of low oxygen is getting shallower, and it's now at around 200 meters. You go down and you get into that low oxygen water. These little bars are different species whose abundances are changing in time. Some of them are sort of tracking the shoaling, some aren't. But basically, what we see in the world ocean is going on in Monterey. We're getting lower oxygen. And off Oregon, this is best demonstrated. Francis Chan's work showed us that, you know, is this really a normal thing? In, to early 2000s, they've seen intense hypoxia events. So this is kind of the data off of central Oregon here. This is sort of looking at a map view. These are all the points they've taken data. And you can see from in the 50s to the end of the century, you'd see this low oxygen zone. This is the oxygen minimum that's generated by that organic debris sinking. High oxygen up here, low here. And in the surface waters, it's typically high. You don't find low oxygen in the surface waters. But you did find that if you looked at the first few years of 2000, you started to see, gosh, there's some low oxygen events happening in shallow water. And in 2005, 2006, we had these intense low oxygen events that were happening on the shelf. And what is going on here? Why is this happening? Is, is the question. And well, first of all, what does it do? Well, here's nice healthy animals, and then they you end up having these anoxic events and it kills animals, of course. Well, I mentioned this before, you get these plankton blooms, this water is sinking and there's respiration, but this occurs usually over several hundred meters of the water column. This is now only a few tens of meters deep, 20, 30 meters deep, and we're getting low oxygen events on the shelf. Why is that happening now but not earlier? Um, and it could have to do with a couple things. It could be that we're in a different phase of the PDO, there's just more productivity on the surface, and so we're getting more remineralization at depth and it's shallower. And that's what's driving it. Or it could be that for the warming reasons I mentioned earlier, that this normal low oxygen zone down the continental slope is shoaling and getting shallower, and now we've reached a tipping point where some sort of mixing event can throw some of this water up on the shelf. And so that low oxygen water that normally was excluded from the shelf is now getting up there. And that's what it looks like is both of those things are happening. That there's more nutrients that are driving this, and this thing is shoaling due to warming, and so it's starting to upwell water all the way under the shelf. And this low oxygen water, which remember is also acidic water, is getting all the way, in fact, all the way to the inner tidal. And so that may be what we're seeing, and you, that's ending up giving us these hypoxic events in shore. Um, the other part of this story that's really become a poster child for ocean acidification is the northwest shellfish problem, where oyster farmers are having a hard time with rearing success of oysters. They can't get the spat to settle, they can't get successful grow out, and 
it's, there's a variety of experimentation going on with this right now to try and determine is this really a low pH event? Because they bring this, this occurs, they know it occurs, the failures occur when there's low pH, low oxygen water. But is it the low pH, is it the low oxygen, or is it something else going on? And so they're trying to figure that out now. But it looks pretty well like it's low pH. Um, now, to kind of get, take this back to the big picture again, this is a, a pteropod, green pteropod, which if you look through the literature, I've seen that it's anywhere between 10 and 90 percent of salmon prey are marine pteropods. So if marine pteropods, Vicki Favory showed that if you acidify ocean water, these don't calcify as well. There's a little shell in these things, most of them. And so if you lose the shell, probably you lose the animal. So we think that there may be some real problems for pteropods in the future that could lead to real problems for salmon. And the big question is, if we lose the pteropods, will there be an alternative source of prey. Will krill or isopods be able to kind of carry the slack, if you will? And that's unknown right now. But of course that's going to play into some societal benefit we hope to bring in. But um, pods are fed on by humpback whales too, aren't they? Pardon? Don't larger cetaceans like humpback whales even feed on the pteropods? You know, maybe so. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I, just a, kind of a can we get a glimpse of the future from some natural areas that already have high CO2? And there's a spot off of uh, Italy, this is Italy right here, and there's a little island called Ischia that has these things, these natural CO2 vents. And usually when you have a CO2 vent in the ocean, it's got methane or sulfide or something else in it that's toxic. But this is 99.7% CO2 or something like that. If Mount Etna is nearby, there are a lot of carbonate formations under it, and the heat from Mount Etna is basically cooking that carbonate and making CO2 evolve from it. And so there's a gradient. I, in fact, I was lucky enough to just last month to swim in here. Um, there's a gradient where these vents are over about 100 meters. And you can go from the low pH, pH areas to the normal pH areas. And this is sort of the low pH area where you can see the seabed. And in the, the low pH areas, you see that the Posidonia, the seagrass that lives there, is, looks nice and green. It grows really well. And the, uh, there, it doesn't have the epiphytes on it that the, the red normal pH area does. Some of the shells are melting. You don't find echinoderms. And if you sort of sum up what's there, this is what the normal system looks like. And this is what it looks like near the CO2. And if you count up sort of what sort of diversity changes you see, for all these groups, green algae, red algae, brown algae, nidarian, sponges, worms, crustaceans, mollusks, echinoderms, fish, the, when you go from the normal areas where you have full diversity, if you call it that, toward the lower pH areas, you get a loss in biodiversity in every group. And so if you go, a 1.0 unit change ended up being about a 50% change in, or 50% reduction in biodiversity. So if this is not telling us this is exactly what the world's going to be like in the future, but it does tell us that the sensitivities of the organisms in this system will give us some inference about what we might see as a change in biodiversity. There are winners here. The winners, in fact, not all the algae did well, but especially some invasive seagrasses did better than the natural species. But it, it, it's a really interesting system, and now there's a lot of experiments going on here to try and look at what's going on in terms of succession and, and this other dynamics associated with CO2. But basically, what we want to know is how will food webs be affected by ocean acidification and these other stressors? And we know we're able to take single species like these pteropods and put them in a jar and understand something about it, but we really want to know if something like that is really sensitive to this, what happens if we lose those? Will we be able to um, compensate for the loss of that, those species by a couple other large zooplankters taking their place in the food web? And we don't know that. And if you lose entire groups that are key members of food webs, then this food web, which is really energy flow from the base up to the top, has to reorganize itself in some way so that energy still flows. And it, we know one way that it'll work is if you just replace the top with microbes. Microbes <coughs> will always win and they'll always do something, but what we want is an intact food web. So what happens when you lose biodiversity? Because what people say is that biodiversity is insurance for ecosystem function. And there's been some studies, Worm et al. published a paper in 2006 where they looked at a variety of large marine ecosystems, mostly fisheries ecosystems over the world. And they showed that if you reduce biodiversity, or those systems that have lower biodiversity, 
They have lower rates of catch, they're less productive. They're more variable in their catch, so they're not as predictable from year to year, probably in part because you don't have that buffering of food energy flow by different species. And those fisheries that with low biodiversity are more likely to collapse. And what does that mean then for acidification, hypoxia, and warming? It means that if these cause a reduction in biodiversity, then we're likely to see these consequences occur for things we care about. So our fisheries, which we really depend upon, the fishermen would love to say, I'm going to go out and catch 80 tons every year, or whatever it is. But he may have, or she may have a great year, but, he, but the fishery may disappear for a few years. So even if we end up having about the same average, it will be, or is likely to be, very disruptive economically because climate variability and climate change is disruptive to ecosystem function, and ecosystem function is tied directly to societal benefits and societal economics. Um, so, so in a cartoon view, we've kind of got this worrisome thing going on with rising CO2, decreasing pH, which changes physiology, and this is where it's kind of easiest to understand what's going on. And then we get into these changes in food webs, shifting benefits, and these consequences for us. And again, if you move further down this line, it's more and more difficult to understand what's going to happen. This is the end we can understand the best. And I think finally, if we're going to um, summarize a little bit of this, but I'm finally going to stop talking for you guys. Um, CO2 emissions are causing ocean change. These are sort of the, the tri three symptoms of a CO2 excursion in the atmosphere. It can be stressful for many organisms with both winners and losers, but even if the winners and losers are balanced, it can still be disruptive for ecosystems. And we, we expect it's going to affect just food webs and fisheries, like we said. What don't we know about this at all? We don't know much at all about long-term effects. We've got a little bit more idea now about sensitive life stages. We expected that some larvae are really going to have a problem, but it turns out for, that's not necessarily true. Some larvae do just fine. Acclimation and adaptation are something we'd love to know a lot more about, but we don't know much about yet at all. It's clear that there is some acclimation ability for organisms. For some of these short-term studies where we've thrown an animal in a jar for a couple days and said, oh, wow, this is a bad thing, there's been some studies where they've put a fish in a jar for a year and showed that, you know, gosh, after six months, it's doing a lot better. So we need to know a lot about that. Multiple stressors. What happens if you have hypoxia and temperature and something else and overfishing and nutrient loading and habitat degradation? It's going to likely be worse. And what about these ecosystem tipping points? We don't know much about that either, and we'd love to know more about that. We may be seeing one in the California current. I don't know. And in this sort of change we see in the PDO, is that just a, a huge change compared to what we're going to see from global warming and associated changes? Or is the PDO nothing compared to what we're going to get by the end of the century? It's something we don't know about. Um, what do we do about it? Well, clearly you guys are in the forefront of this because we now have a national ocean policy, and I'd love to say that. Um, and so ecosystem-based management and marine spatial planning will allow us to at least attack some of the regional parts of this problem. And it's going to be tough to solve the global CO2 problem, but that's we definitely have to get a handle on it. But it doesn't mean we ignore all the other things that are going on, because what you want to do is education, which is essential. Um, Managing ecosystems is essential, and trying to be much more savvy about the way we use ocean resources and care about what benefits we hope to continue to gain is essential. Um, it's not all bad. I don't know if you guys have seen this book. I'm sure some of you have. Um, we've done a good job, in some ways, restoring Monterey Bay, in part just because some of the fisheries collapsed. But it's, it's a better place than it was a while ago. Hopefully, it'll be even better. All these sort of low carbon things, you know about those, we need to do it, and I, I'm going to stop at that. So, and discuss whatever you guys like. Yes? I have a question. Um, these cats are our research coordinator at Channel Islands. Um, we were having just sort of a casual conversation because we're both divers and they're kind of, we're having to reschedule a lot of our days diving just because of significant wind events occurring um, where we had you know, small pack of divers um, a lot and, 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 and seems in higher frequency. So he actually went and just looked online at a, um, some data off of the, it was like 15 feet above sea level or something. You know, it's a buoy 
that just gets that wind, that measures wind speed. We plotted it from 1955 to the present, and what he found is, yes, it is getting windier, and it seems like on average we're having three more days a year with winds in excess of small things, and we're having small pocket advisors, and we can't leave the dock. And so we were just sort of having a conversation, like, is this because, is this climate change, you know, sort of, we're having windier days, which then um, causes more of the sort of upwelling events to occur. We've also had, you know, low visibility days with you know, a lot of productivity happening up our coast. So just we're trying to figure out how this fits into this puzzle. Is this just something that is natural variation, or is it being accelerated or, or augmented through changes? Well, it, you know, it's the, that's the problem with the climate system is there are so many drivers, and they're all superimposed upon one another that it's tough to dissect them one and say, okay, let's get rid of all these others, is there a secular trend? Yeah. Um, and the prediction is that upwelling winds will intensify with warming, because if you're sort of warming the globe, and that enhances poleward heat transport. But uh, I've kind of heard both stories, and if you look at warming records or cooling records, one place doesn't tell the whole story. And so just the California coast, or even one element of the California coast, doesn't necessarily tell you if you're going to uh, anything consistent about the whole system. Mm -hmm. So upwelling winds may have intensified. And my understanding is that upwelling winds have intensified along the California coast over the last 50 years. Um, but if you, uh, there was a couple slides of another talk I was, um, was it Jack Barth's talk? I forgot whose talk it was. That looked at a few different areas around the world and showed that you know there's warming in the Canary Islands or cooling in the Canary Islands, but if you go 300 miles away, it's warming. So there's some variability, but it's unquestionable that it's warming, and at last on the California coast, I think the data are pretty clear that it's, it's increasing upwelling. But increase, I'm sorry, increasing upwelling favorable winds. But increasing those winds doesn't mean that you'll always have the injection of more nutrients into the, into the surface waters, because if you, if you have a water column where cold water's right here and you're upwelling cold, nutrient-rich water from that, and then you warm the ocean, that nutrient-rich layer is now deeper than it was before, and so you have to upwell from deeper to get there. So you may be upwelling more, but you're not pulling up as many nutrients because you're just pulling up warm water. Now, I don't know if that, where that balance lies, mm -hmm. but, and I'm the wrong guy to ask. Francisco, Francisco Chavez is one. But it you know, reminded me of a point I wanted to make a while ago, and that's that there's concern about this shoaling of the O2 minimum zone and kind of this increase in warming at the surface, even protecting it more so that you're, you're really leading to more hypoxic events and how that's going to be a catastrophe for the California current. And Francisco Chavez, who is a biological oceanographer at Ambari and does a lot of this stuff, maintains all of our buoys, and who is also Peruvian, has worked on the Peruvian coast for a long time. The Peruvian system is completely different than ours in one way, because if you go 50 meters, you're down to really low oxygen at 50 meters depth. Here you have to go a couple hundred meters at least. So the pr primary productivity in the Peruvian system and the California current are quite similar. But the Peruvian system has by far the largest sardine industry of the world. Its sardine productivity is lots higher than California's is. So why is that true? Francisco thinks, well, maybe it's because that O2 minimum zone is compressing everything into that upper layer. And what we have here is that we've got a bunch of predators that live deep at night, I'm sorry, deep during the day, and then they come up at night, this vertical migration that I'm sure you're aware of. And so those vertical migrators here can make a living because they can dive down into the dark, cold, oxygen-rich depths. In Peru, they can't do that. They start diving, boom, they hit a wall of oxygen limitation. So they're excluded from the system. And Francisco thinks, maybe if we move through this century and we see more and more intense hypoxia here, does Peru tell us now what California is going to be like in the future? And if so, in terms of a sardine industry, it's not catastrophic. Sardines will be back in Monterey Bay. Well, <laughs> and they're fishing them now. But it just tells us that you can't make this end of sort of ecosystem dynamics end of the consequences is really tough to understand. And we, we can't just say it's going to be a bad thing for us. It might be a terrible thing for salmon. It's certainly going to be a bad thing for anything that wants to live in the OMZ, most deep sea animals.